Recently, something crazy happened in the professional world. Shin Jin Sa and Yi Chang Ho were playing against each other for the Myeongin title, which is like the Korean version of the Meijin, and they resulted in a triple co. That's a no result、uh, game for these two legendary players, and it's not that common that you see this happen. But basically, there are, is this giant part of the board where this co fight matters. And it's not just in any co fight, but it's also a triple co. So the co's rotate out so that basically what happens is they keep playing the same co moves over and over again. Since there's three of them, they can keep doing that. And、uh, unlike, you know, like a double co or a single co where it can kind of resolve or like you can never kill a group or so, something like that, a triple co. It basically just cycles again and again and again. It's quite complicated, honestly, looking at it.、Uh, even the commentators were saying, were kind of confused about what was going on on the board, but eventually they recognized that there was nowhere else to play but this very big triple co area. And the two players kind of looked towards the、uh, tournament director or moderator or whatever you call him. And they made a ruling to, well, since this was a, a double elimination bracket tournament. They needed to determine a winner for this game. And so the way they did that was they would, they had the players clear the board, and Yi Chang Ho and Shin Jin Sa played another game, but with only the time they had remaining from the first game. And I believe it was like a minute Bio Yomi time of、uh, Yi Chang Ho's time, and then Shin Jin Sa had like three periods of one minute Bio Yomi or something like that. And they had to use that time. So basically, they had to play a rapid game after this. A、long game that they played to resolve、uh, who the winner would be. And、uh, spoiler alert, Shin Jin Sa took the, the,、uh, the victory there,、um, but very hard fought by Yi Chang Ho. And、uh, I mean, I guess maybe there was a bit of an advantage for someone a little young on the younger side to play a faster game, maybe needs a little faster, <laughs> faster younger spry brain. Um, but I thought that was an interesting thing that happened in the pro world recently. Welcome to Start Point, the show about Go for Go fans away from the board. Today, I am going to give you guys the recipe, the steps to take to reach single digit Q. That's SDK. If anyone's been confused this whole time, anytime I said SDK, DDK, and all that stuff, that's what SDK means. It means single digit Q. So anywhere from 1 Q to 9 Q would be considered SDK.、Um, This is something I wish someone did for me when I was a DDK. I wish someone would tell me, you know what, this is what you got to do. These are the things you got to do in order to get to SDK. This is, if you do these things, you will get there. And I can't guarantee this, the results for you guys if you want to follow this, but I, this is what I did. This is, I mean, maybe more structured version of what I did.、Um, and if you do all these things to the letter and you still can't get to single digit Q, Then、uh, let me know and maybe even send me your SGF. I'll see what I can do to diagnose your problem. But the、uh, problem will likely, more likely be that you're not going <laughs> to do all these things. And that's why you can't get to SDK rather than you are doing all these things faithfully and, getting, and not getting to SDK. Because I think that if you do do all these things and you, know, you are spending a good amount of time doing them, there's no reason you can't reach SDK, whatever level you are. And so I'm giving you. Basically, the broad strokes, and I want to go into detail about what I think is most important about each step. And, you know, a lot of people give advice.、Uh, for example, the first thing I'm going to say is that you got to play games, but that's where people a lot of that's where a lot of people stop their advice. They just say, play a lot of games, and then they just kind of let you play your games. But let's think about what that really means and what I mean by play a lot of games. So, in my view,、um, If you've heard the past few episodes with Sean and Tin, they've also mentioned this, but you should be playing against human players. If you're playing against bots, that's fine, but if you want to improve, you also at least have to play against human players. And my thing is, my little sauce that I'm going to add to that is play a large amount of relatively fast games. And Don't think of these as serious matches. And I want you to drill these games. Like five minutes main time with 30 second period Bioyomi is what I would say is a fast game or a rapid game, I guess, is another terminology that you could use. But think of it as like an arcade game. 
You want to keep trying again and again and again. You got to drill it. This is a training session. This isn't your weekly serious game. This is just getting your brain used to the flow of Go and what happens on the board and getting exposed to as many different ideas as possible. I think a lot of beginning players may not have this experience. They have anxiety playing against people online. They don't play very often. They only stick to correspondence. I think this is one of the biggest buffs you can get in the early stages of Go. If you play a bunch of fast games and lose a bunch of fast games, this is why we advise players, lose your first 50 games, lose your first 100 games, whatever, as fast as you can. That's really the way that kind of tricks your psychology into playing more games is that the goal is not to win. The goal is to lose. So it completely takes out this anxiety. It completely takes out the mentality of overthinking your games. You need some level of exposure when you play your games and just understand what happens when a Hane happens. What happens when you extend? How a group uh, is strengthened when you push one further? You know, there are so many little things that happen on the go board that you can learn just by playing a sheer number, like a volume, high volume number of games. Um, and so uh, I think that's honestly, maybe out of all the tips I'm going to give you guys today, uh, my number one tip play, if you haven't done it, right. If this is something you haven't done, I'm not saying like if you've been doing this, if you've been playing game after game after game, and you have no problem, uh, you know, going through like late night sessions of playing a lot of games and this is something you already do regularly and you're still not reaching SDK, then take a look at the other stuff I'm about to go to. But if this is something you haven't done and played a good volume of games, uh, this is my number one recommendation as to what you should do. Play a lot of games. Don't think too hard about it. Think a little bit, right? And then understand how your brain is working uh, during these games and do review them if you can. But the most important thing is to at least get a bunch of exposure so you can then step back and take a look at how you've been performing during these games. Um, and again, think of these games rather than serious matches that you're trying to win, but more as drilling and try to have fun with it. Don't take it too seriously. Say, hey, it's okay if I lose. Who cares about my rank? Maybe even hide your rank if, you, if, you, if that makes it easier for you. But um, I know that a lot of people just haven't played a lot of live games against people at, you know, and they, they kind of overthink their move. So playing a lot of games. And then during those games, what I would highly recommend is at the DDK level, don't resign. Um, you need end game practice. If you resign too early in the Joseki, you know, because you screw up a Joseki in the opening, you lose a bunch of stones. Uh, if you do that way too much, I mean, maybe you can drill your Joseki that way. But if you resign, you know, at the um, the drop of a hat, you're never going to get to the end game, and you're never going to be able to play strong end game practice with with your opponent. And and the thing is, with the SDK or the DDK level, um, the game can really flip very very quickly. Um, the entire world that you built can crumble. A lot of uh, DDK players play each other and they don't know, they're both missing very crucial things. And they neither of them play like ships passing in the night. Um, and they kind of have this fragile world where if one of them just finds something here or there, a little bit of Aji, a cut here or there, an Atari, a capture, the entire game could get flipped over. And this is more true at the lower levels because ddk players are not as solid and they don't really protect themselves as much so don't resign don't think that resigning is something you have to do if you feel like you're losing maybe if it's um if you know you have someone you know maybe someone's a stronger player like a, you're a ddk and you're playing against a don level player um even in those games i would say don't resign too quickly but um if if it's that big of a strength gap then and you know like you know this is this is not interesting to me or them anymore then maybe it's okay to resign but overall especially if you're playing against people in your rank for end game practice and the fact that ddk's games can swing super completely in the other direction um don't resign 
Okay. Uh, end game is so critical at the DDK level. I know so many times where I would be winning the entire game and then I would lose because of some stupid end game mistake. And it would be so frustrating for me to have those little holes in, in my, my end game. But I, um, I got stronger because of it. I don't make those mistakes. I don't remember how to make those mistakes anymore because I got stronger and I was traumatized. And on that trauma, I built my strength. Um, there's, yeah, just so much Aji and hidden, uncovered hidden Aji and skill is way more inconsistent at DDK. So don't resign. Uh, and then once you get into the SDK level, once things start to stabilize a little more, you kind of have a sense for like, you can kind of tell how strong a player is. Uh, you can look at a player and you'll be like, oh, this person just, their reading is super sharp. I can't get away with anything. Anytime I try to trick them, they're just on top of it. They're five steps ahead of me. I don't think I have a chance catching up in this game, so I'm going to resign. And at an SDK level, you can say that maybe uh, because they're a little more stable and you can maybe predict that loss a little better and you've had your end, end game practice. Um, but uh, yeah, so play a lot of games, don't resign. And in terms of the anxiety that may come when you play games if you a lot of you don't play games because it causes you to be anxious um you may be anxious for your first few games but if you force yourself to play uh regularly and make it kind of a habit or a routine it will become easier you will be not as scared to play you know what happens to me is i actually when i get into the groove of playing games regularly i feel very confident just opening up a you know fox browser and uh starting a game and I feel very casual about it and I feel like you know I'm just about to have some fun relax and play go but when I haven't played in a while it starts to build up like ooh, I don't know if I want to go back to it like am I going to be as strong as I was and I get these thoughts but I know that if I just force myself to get that first game going and then just get into the habit of playing games regularly it becomes easier um, or that's been my, my experience. Okay. Enough about the games, right? So play a lot of games, but you know, th those are my detailed thoughts on why and how you should be playing a lot of games. Um, next thing I want to cover, uh, maybe this is something controversial. The SDK listeners and Don level listeners, uh, I would love to hear your opinion on this, but I think it's quite crucial to learn basic Joseki. Um, a lot of people don't like to learn Joseki. A lot of people uh, think that Joseki may be too complicated for a beginner to learn uh, or maybe not a, use, a useful uh, thing. But uh, honestly, um, go inside the YouTube channel of the Korean professional Unkyo Do, or Do Unkyo, I guess. Like she writes her name in like the Americanized or like the uh, Westernized order with her first and last name that way. But then like her Korean name would be Do Unkyo. Um, the, she, she really, um, has great Joseki videos and she promotes learning Joseki and I love the way she describes it. And it's kind of completely in agreement with my opinion on Joseki. It provides, um, a lot of shape knowledge, a lot of flow knowledge. It's like studying a pro game almost, except it's not a pro game. It's Joseki. It's like almost better than a pro game. It's like the best moves possible that we know of. Um, and that's Joseki study. And by learning Joseki, you not only learn these shapes and learn how a normal flow of the corner should be, but you also build a foundation of play where you have a regular pattern and then you branch out into variations of that regular pattern. So you know the irregularities, you know what's missing, what's different about it. You know how to adjust your play. What do I do in this situation when I'm doing like this? Whereas if you don't learn Joseki at all, every every encounter you have in the corner may look like a uh, just a random encounter. And you're starting from scratch every time. Maybe you are slowly building your own personal sense of opening there. But by learning actual Joseki, and having a solid foundation of some basic Joseki at the DDK level, um, you can build on that lot knowledge and you can grow your skill and uh, add that knowledge every time you face a different version of that Joseki. Now, uh, it's also very important not to go overboard with this. 
you and I will go over exactly which Joseki I think it is important to learn at the DDK level. And you don't have to do this all at once. Um, try to focus one on one at a time and especially focus on the most simple, easy, variationless Joseki. Not many branches, just very standard stuff. Okay. Um, this is the easiest way I think the extremely low level players can get a step up on their game. That's the first thing I notice when I go into a game review and I'm looking at a DDK player's game. The first thing, obviously, is the first few moves. It's like, does this person play by Joseki or not? And it tells me a lot about um, how much effort they've been play- putting into their GOAT study if they have a solid Joseki opening versus they're playing very random, strange looking moves. Okay, so. The Joseki that you should learn at the DDK level, the basic ones, and remember I said to go over these kind of one at a time and make sure you learn them. And I'll also kind of go over a strategy on if you are having trouble memorizing them, if you're having trouble um, making them your own, I'll I'll kind of go over some tips on that as well. But uh, divide and conquer. So let's focus on a few. Don't do all these at once. I'm going to name all these because this is what the podcast episode is about. I'm going to naming them all so you can work on them throughout time, but um, get out your pencils and papers and write down these Joseki that you should learn. So we're starting with a 4-4 Joseki. The absolute one you need to know is the approach back off Joseki. So when someone approaches with a knight's move on the 4-4 and you back off with a knight's move and then they slide under with a knight's move, that Joseki is the foundation, I think, for all Joseki. Um, It really... I think it is the epitome of an archetype for what the corner is about. And that one uh, is the often the first one that people learn. Um, other four, four Josekis that are very important, you should learn the p- one space pincer Joseki. So if someone approaches with a knight's move and instead of backing off, the approachee uh, pincers that with a low one space. You can search these and uh, just by searching 4-4, four, four, low space one, you know, low one space pincer, uh, Joseki. And the variation that I want you to learn for this one, because this actually does branch out a little bit, is once that one space pincer happens, I don't want you to learn the one where the, uh, the pincered stone player and goes and approaches from the other side. That is a little more advanced. You don't need to do that yet. Learn the one where the the pin C, <laughs> where the pin C goes into the four, the three three after the pincer, um, and then builds that wall, and then there's a little slight variation post AI, but that doesn't really matter that much. Uh, those two four four Josekis, and then the third one I think for the four four, is the kick and extend Joseki. So when this is these are all knights move approach Josekis for the four four. So when someone approaches with a knight's move and as the, um, the uh, you know, approachee uh, responds, instead of backing off, they kick that stone. That stone stands and then you back off and then you make a little extension and then that stone makes, that couple stones makes a three space extension. So this is already teaching you some shape stuff like, oh, you're supposed to extend three spaces off of two stones. Right, and then you see on the other side, the the defending side, they're making a one space, right, because they have a one stone uh, to to jump off of. Okay, uh, you know what? That's already plenty for for if you if you guys don't know those Josekis, don't go farther than this. Learn those first. Okay, don't don't even think about these other ones that I'm going to talk about. But if all of that sounds familiar to you, if you feel comfortable with that stuff, let's move on. Uh, the three three invasion, very important. Way more important, especially after AI. Before AI, this was kind of like an annoying move that came later on in the game. You would be playing, and then at a certain point, this player would just plop into your 3-3, and you'd be like, I thought that was mine, and you know. But now you expect it. Now you almost expect it on move five. One, two, three, four, five. Yes, move five. 3-3 three, three invasion is a perfectly strong opening move, and AI has taught us that uh, because of the way that we um, handle the corner invasion now. So basically this is uh, talking about the 4-4 stone and then the 3-3 invasion to that. And um, the variation, there are a few variations to learn. Um, 
But the main ones, I would say, keep it super simple. Um, you should know that this is a very urgent move when someone invades your 3-3 and that you should respond to it most times. Uh, block that stone, extend, and then and then you should make like a three stone wall and the other the invading the invading color will do a slide uh or do another extension or do another push and then they'll get a hane right very um you know there's a few variations here don't get to the very complicated ones i would say stay away just learn what looks simplest to you for the 3 3 invasion don't go overboard with it uh learn how to handle it right like le- pick a favorite response to the 3 3 invasion and learn how to use that one and then also learn how to use the um i think if you're a fox player you will encounter the double hane i think i i remember climbing up the ranks and that was one of the fox favorites is if you invade their three three they'll double hane you and then they'll retake the corner back so three three invasion double hane joseki and then three three invasion just the standard basic three stone wall joseki um I think it's useful to know these. This is super common, right? And uh, I think some familiarity with with this Joseki. Again, don't go crazy. Don't learn uh, at the DDK level. Don't go past these. Um, it can get quite complicated uh, and really quickly with a three three. So um, if it starts to get scary to you, back off and just keep it simple. Um, there's some great resources out there. GoPro Yonu has a good three three invasion video. Um, but it does go quite in depth. You don't need to go that in depth. You just need to know how to handle it. Uh, kick and extend Joseki applies to the 3 4 as well. I mentioned it with the 4 4. Um, the 3 4 low approach, kick and extend. And then the 3 4 high approach, attack or attach, pull back and extend Joseki. And then the 3 4 low approach, Shusaku's diagonal. So these basic standard, these are very standard and very easy 3 4 Joseki. That was a lot of Joseki that I went over, uh, and I considered these as basic. Maybe I'll even do a video one day to just go over these specifically. But that's a plenty of study material, but th- these are very standard and very common Joseki that everyone should know if you want to get to SDK level. I think this is a good, solid foundation. If there's one Joseki or two that um some of the stronger players feel i i you know are essential maybe it's these are joseki that i am not familiar with and uh, it's keeping me from getting to don level um please let me know please comment what you think is important but this is i think a good handful of starter joseki to to learn i know it's a lot it sounds like a lot if, if you're not familiar with all of these but again just take it easy and take it slowly i think that what i can recommend for if you have trouble memorizing these is um, learn a comfortable amount in one day, like just like a couple variations and enough that you can kind of replay them out in your head in the same day and, or not in the head in your head, but on the board in the same day and memorize the sequence. Uh, And by the way, memorizing the sequence repetition is crucial, right? So what you want to do is replay the Joseki a few times and then try to try to uh, play both stones uh, by yourself. And if you get stuck, just go back and look it up and just go back and see what it was. Okay, now reset and try to play it out yourself. Anytime you forget, just go back and look it up. And then once you can kind of play it out yourself, don't just stop there. Don't, don't just say, okay, I played it out successfully once and I'm going to move on to the next variation. Play it out again. Play it out again. Play it out again. Now learn a different one. Now go back to the first one and play it out again and see how comfortable you can get. And then finally, don't stop there. Do it the next day. This isn't just a one day thing. Uh, you want to repeat it throughout the week. You want to repeat it next week. You want to see, check, do I still know it? The more you do that and the more you check in with yourself with these patterns, the more you will be able to uh, store it in your long term memory. Okay, one last thing about Joseki. This is the important part. You have to go into your games uh, with this Joseki in mind and force yourself to try to use it. And this is uh, another thing GoPro Yanu said. 
um, is that when you learn a Joseki, when you memorize it at first, it's just, it's not really your Joseki. It's a Joseki that you're starting to learn. And then once you've played it, once you've played many, many games with it and seen how it can result in various things, that's when that Joseki becomes yours. And so learn the Joseki, memorize it by just repeating it. And, and maybe some people may have some opinions on whether it's good or not, not to memorize Joseki. Um, I personally think it is a good thing. But uh, once you do that, you got to go into your games and try to use it and try to learn from it, review it and see what went wrong, see what other variations of the Joseki that you want to learn. Um, and then what happens when they don't follow Joseki? What should you do? But now you have this context for what uh, you're starting with, what you've expected in that Joseki, and then you can uh, go from there and judge the next part of the sequence that went off the rails, maybe, and see if you can test your Joseki sense or intuition. Okay, next step to get to SDK is the Sumego portion of it. Okay, so what I want to emphasize with easy or with Sumego is to go easy. Um, Sumego problems, find a set where you feel comfortable solving them in under 20 seconds, uh, where you feel comfortable solving like 80% of them in less than 20 seconds. So relatively easy. And so you just look at it, you just stare at it a little bit, do check a couple sequences and you're like, okay, this works, click, and you're done. Uh, Others, you know, some people do advise don't use an app, don't use a computer. And maybe use a pencil if you can. But if you can't, I mean, you know, we're in the age of the internet. It's hard to get around. But uh, find a set that's easy for you. This is very important. If you find yourself staying minutes at a time on a single problem, you are training and it's good. And not that it's, it's bad. But this is another area where I feel if you haven't done this and you haven't drilled yourself with easy Sumego, this is a huge um, way to step up your game. Um, and Take that set, and uh, there's many resources where you can find sets. You can go to try to Semego Hero. You can go to the OGS website puzzles. Um, one I recommend, maybe it's a little tough sometimes. I would say if you're kind of getting close to SDK, the uh, Chochikun's Encyclopedia of Life and Death, it starts off quite easy, but it ramps up, you know, at certain points where there's some tricky ones in there. But take a, a manageable chunk of easy Sumego where you're solving them pretty quickly and do it again like don't don't just stop there like set off a good chunk of the problems and once you've gone through them do it again and see if you can do it faster and do it again and again until you're kind of bored of it and then move on to the next step it's important to like if you if you uh practice a joseki or even this isn't even about joseki or tsumego this is about like a lot of different things. Joseki, Sumego, even like study problems. If you do a problem and you figure it out and then three months later you go back to the problem and it takes the same amount of time to figure out or it gives you the same problems that you had three months ago, did you really learn anything? This is what I found out about myself. I was I have some study concepts that I wrote down or like I, I put down on an SGF and I wrote to myself, this is how you do this, this is how you do that. And then months later, I went back to it and I'm like, uh, I don't know how to do this. I don't know how to do that. And I'm like, I really need to review these more regularly because I didn't, I clearly didn't learn it the last time I learned it. So it's important to go through it. And this is just like, I feel like a secret trick to get better is to repeat things. Um, so don't just solve the Sumego and don't just keep going and mindlessly doing next Sumego, next Sumego, next Sumego. Try to take it in chunks. I would say take a little set, maybe 20 problems even, uh, and just really familiarize yourself with them. And uh, you will go through it again and you'll be like, oh, this one I remember, this one I remember. And then you'll go back to another one. You'll be like, oh, I am struggling with this. I remember struggling with this last time. I'm still struggling with it. Uh, but then you might get it faster than last time because you kind of remember a little bit more. And so it's going to feel like that. You're going to improve at it. And by repeating it and going through it again, you're making sure your brain really soaks in the material into the roots. Okay. Those are the most practical, easy to follow standard tips that I can give you. That was play a lot of games, learn Joseki, 
do easy Sumego drills. And then the last tip that I have to get to SDK is a very conceptual one that doesn't really have a practical step-by-step -step application, but you have to know, if you wanna to get to SDK, you have to know what a base is. And a lot of you will think, I know what a base is, I don't need to study that, I don't need to think about this. Let me tell you, I thought I knew what a base was for the longest time, and I constantly left my stones without a base. It's hard. It's not an easy concept. And a lot of this is what's so tricky is that once you understand what it is and how important a base is, you take it for granted and you expect weaker players to know what a base is. And you, you kind of question them like, why didn't you make a base here? You should have made a base. Like it's obvious, like it was so obvious to you since you were born, but it wasn't. When you're a weaker player, it's not that easy to understand what a base is. Um, the standard base, the standard definition of a base is a two space extension along the side on the third line. If you have a single stone on the third line and you make two spaces, a two space extension, that is a solid base. You can call that stone or you can call that, you know, a couple of stones as relatively stable as long as there aren't too many attacking stones around it. Um, another way to think about what a base is, is an enclosure is kind of like a super good base. It's like a super, it's like a super base, an enclosure, like whether it's a three, four, um, you know, four, four enclosure, three, four enclosure. When you make these two stones wrap around the corner, it's like a super base. It's like super strong and it's got a lot of room to live and it's very secure. Um, so there are so many concepts around a base, and I would just encourage you to listen to this and see if this all makes sense to you. Um, if you have a single stone on the side of the board without a base, maybe it's fine to leave it alone uh, because of the Mii concept. That stone could take a base in either direction. Maybe there's open space on either side. If that stone is approached on either side by the enemy, that becomes very important for that stone to take a base now. Otherwise, it will be under attack. And so the right response to that is to take a base on the other side. That's why people leave single stones. That's honestly why people leave single stones around, lying around, because they can take a base on the other side. Um, Think about what happens, and this is going back to how you can learn from Joseki, the 4-4 approach Joseki. What do you do when someone approaches your 4-4? You back off with another knight's move on the other side. What does that look like? That looks kind of like taking a base because the other side has been blocked. It's the same concept. So um, this is not as simple as that. There are many other situations where you're like, is that a base? Or where is the best spot to take this base? There's different forms of bases, depending on how thick your stones are, how many stones you have in the area. And this is something you're going to have to learn. You're going to have to get a feel for whether a group has a solid base or not and whether it needs a base. And when can you exploit your opponent's lack of base? But I would want you to meditate on this concept of a base as much as you can. This is such a crucial concept in Go. I don't know if why. I don't know why there are not more videos talking just about getting bases and what bases are because i think that's like such a fundamental and important concept that you need to learn and go so um i highly encourage you to uh, think about it and try to learn about it and and when you review your games think about did i take a base here is this group in trouble because i refuse to take a base or did i miss an opportunity to attack an opponent group that was lacking a base just try to enter your mindset into the base mindset and you will be you will be based i hope the stronger players are not too bored listening to my tips uh maybe a lot of you who are already stk have not followed these and have never played lots of games fast games or whatever and uh have not studied all those Joseki that I, I listed out, although I do think they're pretty standard and you should know by that, you know, by the SDK level, how those work out. Or maybe you do know them and you don't even know that you know them. 
Uh, in any case, I hope you were still entertained by uh, what I thought were the ingredients to get to SDK. Um, and although this whole episode has pretty much been as giant DDK Advice Corner, the actual tip of the day for the DDK Advice Corner is make chaos when behind. What I mean by that is when you're behind in points and you know that you're behind, you lost some crazy group over there or you just don't have enough points, make chaos. Because in chaos, there's Aji, and in Aji, there is possibility. Uh, and the way, the easiest way to make chaos is to attach and then cut, right? That's complicated. So making it complicated, but don't go too crazy. Try to think at least about the chaos and go more deeply into uncharted territories uh, is what I would advise if you're behind and you want to change the game. You're not going to change it by playing normal and boring. For the rest of the game and predictable because then your opponent's just going to keep doing what they're doing and they're going to beat you so the tip of the day for the ddk advice corner is make chaos when behind and it's time for listener mail base six writes i think the points where i've been annoyed by ai cheating have been when it's particularly blatant if I queue up against a 1Q1 one Don player and they just play a completely flawless game because they plugged all or most of their moves into Katago, what's the point? If I wanted to play Katago, I'd just do that instead of playing on OGS. Blatant cheating is pretty obvious because Q players never play those kinds of perfect games. Even playing really well, there's a baseline level of error that happens continuously that doesn't show up with AI. I'm not as bothered by someone cheating more craftily. If you cheat but don't play at a superhuman level, I can still get a good game in, especially if it's someone who does that consistently and is appropriately rated. If you play like a 1k, it doesn't matter to me because if you're a 1k uh, or because you're a 3k, that turns out that turns on AI at a few crux points in the game. A very interesting take there, base 6. I feel like I have that opinion with the Joseki help thing, where if you're you know, looking up Joseki and that makes you couple zone stronger and that's kind of the level you're playing at and I get to play against you and you do that. I have no problem with that. But with AI, I feel like there's something so fundamentally wrong about getting advice from somebody uh, from an external source. And especially if you get to choose when to, you know, you get into the heat of the battle and things are getting tough and you're like, oh, you know what? I can't handle this. I want to know the answer. I'm going to turn on the AI now. I don't know if I can really uh, say that I'm I'm not bothered by that, but at the same time, I can't be bothered by it if I don't know about it, right? So I don't know if I can say that I, I'm more bothered by it. Um, but I would be uh, honestly, I'd be I maybe have the opposite opinion as you. Someone blatantly cheating with AI and just you know so obvious it's just gotta go. I'd be like, ah, oh, what a waste of time. Whatever. You know, I don't know why they're doing that. They're probably not gonna do it for very long and I don't really care. I lost, whatever. But if it's someone cheating more craftily and they're sneaking it in, it's like, I think I would be more frustrated with that. I don't know, what do you guys think? Thanks for writing in, Base 6. And Syzygy wrote, I never heard of this podcast, added, well, welcome aboard. And Syzygy, uh, glad to have you here uh, listening to Starpoint. And then GG LeBlanc 2 says, one point is that cheaters don't have to use Katago. Using a different AI closer to your rank would be much harder to detect. Also, people can create an AI account where a the AI plays exclusively. This was more common when Go servers didn't have many AI players. Thanks for writing in, GG LeBlanc. Uh, yeah, that's, again, that's something I touched on in the cheating episode where you can cheat subtly you can you don't have to cheat 100 percent max all the way and be found out you can very much use a weaker ai you can use it sparingly you can use it at only some parts of the game and it's virtually undetectable uh, you know if you use it sparingly enough so it's a tough uh it's a tough problem to face uh, thanks for writing in matthew kavach writes thank you for the podcast smiley face thank you so much matthew for your uh support and then trevoke writes gotta share the kifu because this uh, i'm trevoke is referring to the game where i thought my opponent was cheating or my teacher rather thought they were cheating but i didn't share the kifu link because i don't want to call to attention to someone 
uh, who was not cheating, and I don't know for sure they're cheating, so I don't want to. I don't want people to be going and then de digging deep into that. But uh, thanks for writing in. And then Hal nine hundred writes, I only accept the vibrator cheating method known from chess. They do it all the time, and uh, I'm not gonna comment on that one. <laughs> Freddy Wo Red We Freddy We Freddy Wio writes. This is the worst drawback of AI. Very discouraging to play online. Uh, you must be a relatively strong player because, unless I'm just oblivious, I don't encounter ma many cheaters online, so I'm not very discouraged. Um, and I think that the AI players generally rise pretty high up, uh, maybe higher than my rank. And so maybe you're a higher rank than me, or I just don't know how to. Or maybe you're just anxious about the fact that their cat could be cheaters. So, yeah, that's a new thing. We have to, um, you know, back in the day, in the uh, they the only way you could cheat was by moving around stones and pocketing them. Which is, I mean, I guess that was a problem back then, but it's harder to do. And uh, now it's like you're behind a screen and you can just kind of go undetected. So, yeah, uh, it's a new problem. It's a new uh, first world problem. But uh, yeah. Thanks for writing in. My boy writes, I was just scrolling for a star point to listen to. Perfect timing. Awesome. I'm glad to be there when you uh, need me to be there. But uh, I am uploading regularly on Mondays. So if you want to expect me at a certain time, that's when I do. Uh, that's when I release star point episodes. Uh, only a vagabond writes, are you planning to do a Huang Longshi episode? Maybe. Maybe one day I will uh, see if I have the time to do the research and uh, put one of those out. Uh, I would love to do a Hong Long show episode, but I'm not sure if that's the next pro I would do. I, um, I'll have to see. Uh, but you did put a vote in for Huang Long show, so I will consider a little bit more. Thanks for writing in. And Sada Haru writes, I think in the professional world, it's getting better regarding cheating, by the way. Many tournaments have strict controls to prevent cheating and people take this seriously now. In the amateur world, however, I think things are still quite lax, especially when it comes to online games. I still meet cheaters on OGS from time to time. I try to report them if possible, but it seems like there are so many reports that the admins are having difficulties handling them. Thanks for writing in, Sadaharu. Um, yeah, I uh, I don't feel I don't envy the admins at all for having to deal with cheating. Like, what are you supposed to do? Like, people report cheating. You look at the account and then like analyze with AI a little bit, and you're like, uh, it's kind of good, kind of errorless, but I'm not sure. What's the standard? Like, how are you supposed to do that? We need to come up with like a counter AI to detect AI cheaters. It's it's I mean. I don't know what to say. Like, it's a tough, tough problem. Um, thanks for writing in Sadaharu. Uh, and then the question of the week is, for the DDKs, what have you been trying to do to get to SDK? Have you been doing the things that I talked about? Do you know all this stuff that I talked about already? For the SDKs, how did you get to SDK? Um, I kind of laid out what I felt was the crucial bones of what I did to get to SDK. I didn't do it super intensely regularly. I did it for over a very long time. Let's keep in mind, do it, you know, at the rate that you feel comfortable with. You don't have to be an INSEE level studier to become SDK, really. Uh, and then for the Don players, tell me, how did you get to Don level? I'm, I'm trying to get there. So tell me what I need to do. All right, do the same thing for me. Uh, if you want to share your thoughts on this question or you have a ghost story to share or you have a question of your own to ask me, you can always comment on YouTube or the Reddit post for this episode or email me directly at starpointpaduk at gmail.com. That's starpointbaduk at gmail.com. If you're a YouTube listener, I would greatly appreciate a like and or subscribe. And if you're a podcast listener, a review and or rating would also help. A very special thank you to Jeffrey H. for supporting Starpoint. And this uh, closing joke today uh, comes from not myself. I uh, am a pro prolific writer of, OG, uh, of Go jokes, and I believe I'm one of the most pro prolific writers of Go, o Go jokes on the internet right now because I have to do one every episode and I still have some left. But this one is from not me, but from Mark5000 on the OGS forums. What is Elvis Presley's Go rank? Thank you. Thank you very much. And thank you for listening. Keep playing Go.